The Lizardmen are one of the strangest factions in the game, both visually and mechanically. They hate chaos more than anything else, but also struggle to play well with others due to their cold-blooded diplomacy and likely their slightly menacing appearance. They've not seen a ton of changes since their release, but are still a lot of fun to play with a ton of mechanics to master to use them well. First of all, the pros and cons of the campaign gameplay. First up, the pros. The Blessed Spawnings can give you three powerful units early on when you may struggle in battles to give you a boost before you can unlock proper recruitment. All Lizardmen factions can also get access to Lord Croak, who is the most powerful caster in the game, and makes your late game way easier. If you can get other Lizards on your side, you can get Confederations a lot easier than most factions through their cold-blooded approach to diplomacy. As for the cons, in a weird situation, initially they don't get on with anyone, evil or good, so you spend the first chunk of the campaign with no friends and a ton of enemies. The Geomantic web mechanic is also very dated and takes a huge number of turns to fully come online and feel its effects. And finally, they tend to struggle with cash early on since they do have a pretty expensive roster alongside not a ton of ways to make money, with low early income buildings and a lack of trade. I'll now go through the different factions and their effects. First up we have Hexawattle, and they are of course led by Lord Mazdamundi. The faction effects, they lose 10 relations with most factions, have a 50% cost reduction for star chamber buildings, and a 30% cost reduction for all rights. Mazdamundi's army, he gains 50% range for his own spells, minus 50% to the miscast chance, plus 15 winds of magic power reserve capacity, plus 50 XP per turn for all units in the army, and minus 50% upkeep for temple guard units. His faction of course starts in Hexawattle, and his starting army has Temple Guard, two Saurus Warriors, two Javelin Skin Cohorts, a Revivification Crystal Bastilodon, and a Crocscore. He also starts with a Saurus Scar Veteran Hero. For his climate preferences, Savannah, Desert and Jungle are suitable, Magical Forest, Mountain, Temperate and Temperate Island are unpleasant, and Frozen, Wasteland, Ocean and Chaotic Wasteland are uninhabitable. To get the short victory as Mazda Mundi, you need to destroy the Keepers of Bliss and Skeggy, as well as Occupy, Loot, Raise or Sack 30 different settlements. The two factions you need to get rid of here are your Starting War and a pretty weak Norskin faction that's right next door, so this one is relatively straightforward. You want to head north to take out the Keepers of the Bliss's Starting Army and Settlement, then move south to take their final bit of land and wipe them out completely. Once your Stein province is secure, you can move east to take on Skeggy, who also only have two settlements. As long as you build your army up as you go, they should go down relatively easily. Once this is all taken care of, you can do whatever you want to get those settlement numbers up, but your best bet is moving south into Lustra, where you'll find a bunch of habitable lands to occupy, as well as many lizard allies to buddy up with and set up potential confederation later on. Next up we have the last defenders, and they are led by Krokgar. The faction gains minus 15% upkeep for armies led by Saurus Oldbloods, Saurus buildings grant more bonuses to veterans and oldbloods, and all veterans and oldbloods gain 1% weapon strength per rank and 30% to their XP gain. As for Krokgar's army, he gains minus 15% upkeep to all units, plus 25% to their ambush success chance, and plus 25% to XP gain for Saurus Warriors and Cold One Rider units. This faction starts in the Golden Tower, and his starting army has two Saurus Spears, units of Blessed Shielded Saurus Warriors, two Javelin Skin Cohorts, some Cold One Spear Riders, and a Feral Stegodon. He also starts with a Skink Priest of Heavens. His climate preferences are the same as Hex Wattle. For his victory conditions, he needs to destroy Clan Morbidius, Clan Mordkin, the Silver Host, the Drakenhof Conclave, and the Leaf Colors Tribe as well as Occupy, Loot, Raise or Sack, 30 different settlements. You have some pretty extensive victory conditions here with all the factions you need to take out, so you're going to be chasing factions down for quite a while. To start off with, you have Mordkin right on your doorstep, so you can start with them and chase them all north. Once they're taken care of, you can keep pushing north to take on the Silver Host and work right up to the mountains, but don't go any further than that. Once this is done, you can head either south or west, depending on if you want to fight rats or vampires and orcs. You can even get two armies at this point and take on both at the same time, just be cautious of entering too many walls at once and getting overwhelmed. If you manage to take out this laundry list of factions for the conditions, you should also have plenty of lands and just have to pick up a couple more to reach 30 and get that short victory. Next we have the Cult of Sotek, and they are led by Tenuin. This faction has plus 200% upkeep for Saurus infantry and temple guards until completing stage 1 of the Prophecy of Sotek. This is a mechanic unique to the faction and is displayed at the top of the screen. The Prophecy has 3 stages and each stage has their own objectives that must be completed to move on. Generally, if you keep expanding, fighting and sacrificing, you'll keep moving forward and feeling the benefits. It also gains access to sacrificial offerings from winning battles, which can be offered to Sotek to receive a variety of awards. You also receive a new post-battle option to capture captives and gain even more. These sacrifices have 5 tiers, and each tier is unlocked after completing stages of the Prophecy and related missions. The higher tiers obviously have more powerful effects and units, so progressing the Prophecy and making continuous sacrifices should be a top priority. They also have minus 75% to the cost of the rights of Sotek. For Tehenuin's army, he grants minus 3 to corruption locally, 10 leadership when fighting versus Skaven, and plus 10% physical resistance for skink units. His faction starts in Zlanzek, and his starting army has two red crested skinks, three skink skirmishers, an arc of Sotek Bastildon, some croc scores, a salamander hunting pack, 
and a Saurus Scar Veteran Hero. His climate preferences are the same as the other two, and for his victory conditions, he must destroy Clan Pestilence, Clan Spittle, and Clan Scrat, and complete Stage 1 of the Prophecy of Sotek, as well as the 30 Settlements. All of the Skaven Clans you need to get rid of start out pretty close to you, so you can get rid of them relatively quick if you focus on them. The Starting War is easy to steamroll and get rid of in a single turn, and Pestilence are a straight shot north, but will require a more powerful army, so do some recruiting before you head out to take them on. If you manage to finish them, then you can head east to take out Spittle and own a pretty good chunk of land. At this point, you can take over the rest of Lustre whilst you work on progressing the Prophecy, and you'll have those settlements in no time. Just keep friendly with Lizards, and the Confederations will come. Tlaqua is led by Tic Tac Toe, and in his faction, the Skink Heroes start with a Pterodon Mount. He has access to the unique Rites of Sunki, which increases the campaign move range of all arms and characters when used. He gains 25 cents to the campaign line of sight for all characters, and all Pterodons in his faction gain a unique Death from Above ability. As for Tenuin's army, he grants minus 50% upkeep for Pterodon Riders, Ripidactyl Riders and Quattle Units, and 10 melee attack when in foreign territory. His faction starts in Tlaqua, and for his starting army, he has 3 Skink Cohorts, 2 Skink Skirmishers, a unit of Horned Ones, a unit of Fire Leech Bowlers Pterodon Riders, and 2 regular Pterodon Riders, as well as a Skink Chief Hero. His climate preferences are the same as the others, and for his victory conditions, he must maintain control of the western jungles and central jungles, either via direct ownership, vassals or military allies, as well as destroy the Oracles of Sinch and the 30 settlements. The starting war here will see you taking control of the western jungles and most of the central, so you can pursue that and take out their settlements to wipe them out and cross off your two victory conditions. After this, all you need to do is take out Kairos, so keep expanding into the south while building up the best army you can to send into the waste to take him out for good. Once he's dealt with, you can expand any way you want, but some good choices are to the north into the desert, or the east towards Krokgar, we can get a possible confederation on top of all the land up grabs. Next up we have Itza, and they are led by Gorok. His faction has access to the Rite of Resilience, which grants a barrier and defense bonuses for Saurus. He also starts the campaign with Lord Croak, grants a 500 HP barrier for all units when defending a settlement, and 500 defensive supplies for all siege battles. His entire army gains 15% unit mass and 10% missile resistance. His faction starts in Itza, and his starting army has two shielded Saurus Spears, two shielded Saurus Warriors, two Javelin Skin Cohorts, and a revived Crystal Bastilodon. I'm sick of saying it, it's hard to say. And of course, he starts with Lord Croak as his hero. His climate preferences are the same as the others, and for his victory conditions, he must destroy Clan Pestilence, the Pallid Nurslings, the Blood Keepers, and Clan Spittle, as well as the 30 Settlements. That starting war will pretty easily secure you a starting province and get rid of the Nurslings, so that's a pretty strong start. Once they're taken care of, I turn my attention to Skrulk before it gets too strong, so continue to expand south and take him out as soon as possible, all while building up your army to be as strong as you can. Once he's gone, you can loop around to the east and take out Clan Spittle with relative ease, or you can head north to take out the Blood Keepers. Once both taken out, you should have plenty of land, and can keep expanding until you get those settlements by moving in basically any direction in Lustria and keeping friendly with other lizards. Next we have the Spirits of the Jungle, and they are led by Nakai the Wanderer. Nakai is a horde faction, so cannot take settlements, and instead upgrades buildings inside of his army to unlock units for him and other armies to recruit. His horde has buildings in it that unlock the recruitment of new units as well as a couple of buffs to his army. Other armies have a much smaller selection of buildings which reduce the global recruitment duration of units, allowing them to use anything Nakai has without waiting 6 months for them to be recruited. His vassals occupy any settlements he conquers and unlock him rewards the more you gift them. He has 3 choices when gifting settlements, and depending which you choose, you'll unlock different rewards for your faction in the form of buffs and blitters spawning units. He also earns favour of the old ones, which can then be spent on research, rites and temple rewards. He also has two unique rights, the Rite of Allegiance, which causes all regions belonging to the vassal to cause attrition to enemies, and the Rite of Rebirth, which spawns an army of blessed units from the capital of the Defenders of the Great Plan, which does not replenish. This faction also gains plus 3 recruit rank for Croxcore Ancients, and he also has a unique research tree that abandons most infrastructure and instead focuses on army improvements, recruitment, and vassal income. For Nakai's army, it gains minus 15% to the recruitment cost and plus 5 melee defense croc scores and sacred croc scores. His faction starts outside of the Tower of Ashung. His starting army has two shielded Saurus warriors, a unit of sacred croc scores, two regular croc scores, and a stegodon, as well as a skink priest of heaven's hero. For their climate preferences, everywhere are suitable since they can't take settlements, so it doesn't really matter. For their victory conditions, you must destroy the Blessed Dead, the Dread Flag Fleet, and the Zhangxi Rebels, as well as the 30 settlements. All of your targets are to the north, so once the initial war is taken care of, that's where you'll be heading. You can take on anyone you find along the way who doesn't want to be friendly with you, and get more land for your vassal, as well as loot and levels. The rebels are to the northwest, so they'll be a good target. After that, head to the east coastline and work your way north to take out your other targets. Once they're taken out, you can literally do whatever you want since you have no climate preferences and just need to get those settlement numbers up. Now, final faction is the Ghost of Pahuax, and they are, of course, led by Oxyotl. This faction gains minus 25% upkeep for all Skink and Chameleon Skink units, plus one melee attack and defense, leadership speed, and missile damage per XP level for all Skink infantry, 
and he has access to the visions of the Old Ones. These are missions to stop chaos all over the world, and Oxyotl is able to teleport to these missions, his capital, and silent sanctums containing the capstone of Tepok. Failure to complete these missions will result in penalties to your faction and the map in general, so stay on top of it as much as you can, otherwise things can quickly spiral out of control. Silent Sanctums are their equivalent of Undercities and allow Oxyotl to build a number of buildings to allow him to keep tabs on different areas of the map, harass enemies and buff his own armies in the area. They can be built under any settlement you have vision on and require a certain number of gemstones earned by these missions to be built. For Oxyotl's army, they gain immunity to diplomatic penalties from trespassing, they have access to the Masterful Ambush Stance, gain 50% armor piercing missile damage for all skink infantry units and plus 100% XP when fighting versus forces of chaos. His faction starts in the Godless Crater, and his starting army has two Chameleon Stalkers, two Chameleon Skinks, three Javelin Skink Cohorts, and two Feral Bastilodons, as well as a Skink Oracle Hero. For his climate preferences, everywhere is suitable, and for his victory conditions, he must complete six Visions of the Old Ones missions on normal difficulty or higher, as well as the 30 settlements. This one is pretty straightforward since all you need to do is clear missions as they appear. I would advise you to build up Oxjettle's army whenever you can and keep it as powerful as you possibly can and then send him around to complete as many missions as he can safely do in a single trip before coming back home to rest and replenish. I wouldn't advise occupying settlements on these travels with the intention of growing them as sooner or later a mission will appear and cause him to have to move on, leaving that territory vulnerable. Only settle where you feel comfortable expanding and can build an army there to keep the area safe. If you keep moving forward and hitting end turn, you complete the missions and then you just need to get all the settlements, so expand away once or just sack and raise your way to the finish line. Now we come to the faction mechanics. First up we have the Blessed Spawnings. Certain missions appear over the course of campaigns and when completed you'll receive Blessed Spawnings which can be recruited for no upfront cost and are slightly superior versions of basic units, so it can be pretty useful to your Armies. Not much to this one, just complete missions for free units to recruit instantly. Next, the Geomantic Web. This web connects all settlements in the world, and as it builds in strength, so too do your commandments. The web strength can be checked from the overlay, and the higher it is, the more powerful your commandments become. You can see what affects web strength in the overlay, but all you really need to know is build and upgrade the Geomantic Pylon whenever possible to get to the higher tiers. Next, we have Astromancy. This is a unique movement stance to the lizards, which offers a variety of powerful effects. They have an increased chance of intercepting armies using the underways and similar stances. They have an increased ambush defense chance. Vanguard deployment is granted to some units, and they gain 150% to their campaign line of sight, all at the cost of a 25% movement range penalty. This is great for using when moving into hostile lands, keep yourself safe from ambushes, and get a good look at what you're dealing with as you move in. And finally, we come to the rights. The lizard men have access to four rights, which can be used to activate effects for your faction. Each right has its own cost cooldown and duration, and using any one puts all of them on cooldown for five turns. Some sub-factions have their own unique rights, as I mentioned in the factions section, but the basic ones that you get are used by Mazda Mundi, Krokgaard, Henuin, and Oxyotl, and are as follows. The right of Primeval Glory summons an army full of dino units at your capital that can be used like a regular army, but cannot replenish. All your armies also unlock the Feral Cold One summon ability in battle, and all effects last for 15 turns. The right of Sotek buffs skink units in the faction, as well as ambush chance, while causing attrition to enemies in your territory. The Rites of Frosty buffs all armies with passive XP, recruit rank and capacity and more post battle loot, and the Rites of Awakening unlocks a Slan Mage Priest for recruitment. Now we come to the Lord Skills. First up we have Lord Master Monday. First things first, with any spellcaster we need to grab those spells. Maz has a unique set all of his own, so grab any you want as they are mostly pretty good. After this you can go into his unfathomable presence and reserves of Eldritch energy lines as they are unique to him and have some pretty great effects. His top row also has resistances and XP increases for other lords and heroes, so it's all worth getting. After this, you can head into the blue tree, and you're going to go into Bonded Service since lizards have expensive units, and then Fervorant to get the Draft Master, then Lightning Strike, and Gifts of the Jungle for that replenishment, and then finally Renowned and Feared, which has some pretty great effects. Finally, we can close in the Inspiring Presence tree, focusing on those endgame units to make the army as powerful as possible. Next up, we have Krokgar. We're going to start off in the blue tree, going the exact same options as Maz. Upon reaching level 10, he can start to pick up Destroy skills, which will assist his army when fighting against specific factions, so grab any to help you in current and future wars. You'll also be able to pick from a blessing, and I like either Slax Cottle, the Replenishment, or Itzel for the Dino buffs. His top row has buffs to his aura, some resistance and ability, buffs to upkeep and control, and an XP share, so grab all of that. You can then go into the Inspiring Presence line for those endgame unit buffs, and any spare points into the Predatory Fighter tree to make him better in his own combat, and offense is the best choice there, especially once he's on a mount. Next up we have Tenuin, and we're going to go straight into those spells to get him having more of an impact in battles. Lore of Beasts is pretty good, so grab any spells you want and he'll have a great time. Then once you unlock them, you can choose between the Fanatic and Promises of Reconstruction. Both are pretty great with Fanatic focusing on battle buffs for skink units and Promises focusing more on general campaign buffs. His topper has resistance and the XP share, so all good choices here. Now finally we can go into the blue tree, picking the same choices as before, then Inspiring Presence for endgame units, then anything spare into Predatory Fighter to buff him in combat, and I would suggest tankiness to go with his Stegodon mount. Next we have Tic-Tac-Toe, we're going to start in the blue tree, going the same options as the rest of them, then once you hit level 10 you can pick a blessing just like Krokgar, 
Then at level 12, he can go into his Precision Strike line for all kinds of buffs to his and his own units in combat. His top row has Resistance and XP share, so good choices. Then Inspiring Presence for endgame units, maybe focusing more on flies here. And finally, Predatory Fighter, and I'd focus on charge, speed, and damage to make him as deadly as possible, since he'll never be a tank no matter what you do. Next we have Gorok, starting the blue tree, going the same choices as everybody else. At 10, he can use a Blessing, and he can also go into his Unrelenting Assault line, which has a ton of buffs to himself and the army in combat. His top row has buffs to his leadership, aura, resistance, control, upkeep, and the XP share, so all the great choices. Now we can go into the Inspiring Presence line and then finish in Predatory Fighter and you can go for damage or tank since this lad is such a great fighter, he can do it all. Next we have Nakai, starting off in the blue tree and mostly go the same as usual but focus on Spawn of Itza first for Accelerated Horde Growth. Once you hit level 10, you want to go into his Legendary Warrior line for a ton of buffs to himself and the army. His top row has Leadership, HP, Resistance and an XP share, so all good there. Then Inspiring Presence for endgame units. Then Predatory Fighter, focusing on damage to make him more impactful in combat. And our final Legendary Lord, Oxyotl. Start in the blue tree, picking all the usual skills as always. Once you can, you want to go into the Ancient Knowledge Tree for buffs to a bunch of areas of the campaign and army, and it's all worth picking up. His top row has Resistance and an XP share, so all great there. Inspiring Presence for those unit buffs, maybe focusing on sneaky units to match his playstyle, then Predatory Fighter, focusing on making him a ranged threat. First of our generic lords is the Slan Mage Priest. These are pretty similar to Master Monday, and pretty much follow the same order. Start off grabbing their spells, going for your chosen law, and picking whichever you feel is best. Then they have their reserves and unfathomable line, which are both great and can be completed for some great effects. The Sopra has resistance and the XP share, so all great there. And finally we can get into the blue tree and go for the usual choices. And finish off in the inspiring presence tree for those endgame unit buffs. For the Crocs Gore Ancient, we're going to start off in the blue tree, go the exact same as usual. Once you can, go into their obdurate till death line, picking up pretty much everything. The choice between meat shield and dealer in death is a tough one, since both are great. I'd probably go for the latter for some beefy damage boys. The top row has buffs to leadership, HP, resistance and the XP share, so all great. Inspiring presence for those endgame unit buffs, then predatory fighter to buff their damage since they are powerhouses in combat. For the red crested skink chief, start in the blue tree, making the same choice as everyone else, then the Warriors Crest line at choosing one of the three options each tier, and basically all of them are great, so just pick your favourite. The Sopro has the usual resistance and XP share, then Inspiring Presence, then Predatory Fighter, and we go in tanky for the Stegodon. And finally, the Soros Old Blood, and these are basically simple versions of Krotgar. Start with the blue line, same choice as usual, pick a blessing of your choice once you can, go into the top row for leadership, resistance, control, upkeep, and the XP share and then Inspiring Presence for endgame unit buffs, and Predatory Fighter for some damage once we're on the Carnosaur. Now we come to the heroes, first up we have the only legendary hero, Lord Croak. On the campaign map, he can use Colossal Deliverance, which can damage walls or the entire settlements when upgraded, he can boost income, stimulate growth, and then replenish troops or provide training when embedded in an army. Croak needs to be in armies, so get him in one and go for his spells as soon as possible. All of them are got here, so get everything here for some crazy value in combat, as well as a bunch of passive, some extra effects if you really want them. His unfathomable presence and reserves of Eldritch energy lines are both great for buffing his survivability and magic. His top row has a great damage resistance ability, passive ward save, buffs to leadership, control, research, his wound recovery time, resistances, and the XP share, so everything is great here. And finally, his bottom has a bunch of bonuses you can provide just by being in an army, so grab the ones you like best, or all of them, and he'll provide a ton of value. Next up, we have the Saurus Scar Veteran. On the campaign map, they can assault garrisons, wound, assault units, spread control, and provide training when embedded in an army. These lads are best used alongside a spellcasting lord to provide some presence on the front lines. You can start with training for free XP, then go into the predatory fight line and pick up basically everything here over the course of the campaign, focusing on damage since eventually you'll get a Carnosaur and you'll get a ton of value. The top row has resistances as well as control, action success chance and an XP share for other heroes of the same type, so all interesting and useful picks. And finally, spread control is decent for clearing up when moving through tainted lands. Next up, the Skink Chiefs. On the campaign map, they can damage walls, assassinate, hinder replenishment, boost income, and replenish troops when embedded in an army. These guys can either be campaign assassins or battle skirmishers. The campaign is pretty simple. Assassinate, specialist, and the rest of the blue line except replenish troops, and you're done. The battle replenish troops is a great choice for any army, and the dance of death line for all kinds of combat buffs. Now I'd focus on the speed and their ranged power to keep them working well. The top row has boosted their speed and sneakiness, resistance and the XP share, so all great choices. And then finally boost income for some extra cash. Next we have the Skink Oracle. On the campaign map, they can assault garrisons, wound, assault units, stimulate growth or increase mobility when embedded in an army. These guys belong in your armies with their spells and monstrous damage from their mounts. First you want to grab all their spells since they are missing out on value without them, then increasing mobility is great for extra movement range. The top row has great abilities, speed and sneak upgrades, resistance and XP share so are all worth picking up. And finally, Divinatory Authority has busted them in combat and I'd focus on ranged prowess to keep them safe in casting and leaving frontlines combat as a last resort if you really need them. And finally, we're the Skink Priests. On the campaign map, these can steal technology, wound, block armies, cleanse corruption and provide scouting when embedded in an army. These guys are pure spellcasters, so get them into armies and go for their spells immediately. Just grab them all since there's nothing else really to spend points on here. 
The top row has some resistance and ability and an XP share, so that's all useful. And then scouting and cleanse corruption can help some extra items and clearing corruption wherever they go. Now we come to the commandments. As I mentioned earlier, the commandments of the lizards are affected by the geomantic web strength. At rank 2, all of them have their full effects, minus the relations with other lizards, so that's what I'll be showing here. Alignment of War reduces recruitment cost and increases recruit rank, leadership and weapon strength for all armies locally. Of course, great for recruitment, but also when you're fighting in your own lands. The Alignment of Order increases control, reduces plague spread chance and duration, enemy hero success chance, attrition when under siege and corruption, as well as granting local armies the Holy Stellar ability. Great for maintaining control of a province when under attack from basically anything like plagues, corruption and even sieges. The alignment of monuments increases research rates and the chance of winds of magic increasing in strength and reduces construction time for all buildings. This is great when you're doing some building to get it done quicker, as well as having on passively for faster research if you don't need any cash more urgently. And finally, the alignment of crafting increases growth and income. Of course, great to have on most of the time to keep your provinces growing quickly and bringing in as much cash as possible. And finally, we have the research tree. The Lizardman tree is split into eight areas and each require a building to be built in the first half and then other buildings to be built in the second half and final projects. Each tree has its own focus from an area of the roster to industry to heroes or general infrastructure. Honestly, to start off with, you'll be forced to just research wherever you can and then focus on what you need as more projects become available. This is one of those where getting to the end of a single tree won't get you a ton extra, so just spread the love to fix whatever problems you have right now is the way to go. Just make sure you have at least one of each of the buildings required, otherwise you won't be researching anything. And that is everything you need to know on how to play the Lizardman campaign, and we've got the battle guide coming next Friday to run you through the entire roster as well as compositions and more, so subscribe if you want to see that. Hoping to hit 50k by the end of the year, so I would appreciate the assistance. Also, join the Discord to vote who the next guide should be. Vote closes in about a week, so make your choice before it's too late. If you enjoyed this video and not find it useful, then consider dropping it a like. And if you really enjoy the content and want to support it directly, then consider becoming a member on YouTube or a patron on the Patreon. Doing so gets you early insights into future content, increased voting power, discounts on merch, as well as shout outs at the end of videos like Henry took of his part at the officer's tier. Thank you to all supporters, one last thank you for watching and for now, I've been Colonel Damders, and I will see you next turn.